Good evening, I'm Salma Habibu. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you breaking news of our United Nations Committee meeting. Our very own Shade Simister is on the scene. Let's go to her now live for more details. Shade? Good evening, Salma. I'm here at the United Nations Committee meeting where the International Council of Nurses are here to present the issues and recommendations of HIV AIDS on global health. Let's tune into the meeting now. The HIV AIDS epidemic is a major global health issue. Even with the advancement in life-saving medications, HIV is still a leading cause of death and threat to health for millions worldwide. The implications of HIV AIDS epidemic on global health are numerous and further complicated with the influence of economic globalization and neoliberal policies. Economic globalization influences the HIV AIDS epidemic in several ways. The effects of economic globalization create situations that force women into sex work as a means to support their family, also known as survival sex. In these situations, women are powerless in negotiating safe sex practices, which increases their risk of HIV transmission. Furthermore, globalization leads to an increase in the migration of healthcare professionals in developing countries to developed countries to find better employment options. In turn, these developing countries suffer an economic loss from funding training for these professionals and further worsens the already shortage of healthcare workers. Neoliberal policies such as, such as uh, structural adjustment programs force developing countries to cut funding for social services such as the healthcare sector, as well as introduce user fees for health services. These policies affect those in poverty and their access to healthcare, particularly targeting the affordability of anti antiretroviral medication. Due to the unequal distribution of wealth stemming from globalization, HIV AIDS is a disease of poverty instead of a sexually transmitted disease. In developed countries, HIV AIDS is considered a chronic disease due to the availability of antiretroviral therapy. However, in developing countries, HIV AIDS is a death sentence due to the non-availability of antiretroviral therapy. Lastly, neoliberal globalization negatively impacts the health determinants of HIV, such as gender equality, income, and socioeconomic status. For example, the underfunding and privatization of social services such as schooling directly impacts the health determinants of education and literacy, which increases vulnerability to HIV due to lack of education. Now, let's learn more about the implications of HIV AIDS on global health. The HIV AIDS epidemic has contributed to the cycle of poverty, especially in developing countries. In hard hit areas, the victims of HIV are often the main income earners of the household. Furthermore, effects of HIV on physical and mental functioning can make maintaining regular employment difficult. Work responsibilities can also conflict with their healthcare needs. The loss of main income sources can create significant economic instability in a household, especially those already at the edge of poverty. Moreover, HIV-related discrimination can place HIV-positive patients with low education at risk for employment loss. This epidemic has also left millions of children orphaned, has, has disrupted village and community life, and contributes to the erosion of civil order and economic growth. In sub-Saharan Africa, the number of orphans are on steady rise due to AIDS-related deaths of guardians. Children become deprived of care and guidance from parents, which can translate to social problems as they grow up. Statistics show that many of these children end up dropping out of school due to lack of resources, financial constraints, stigma, and discrimination, or simply because they must prematurely become caregivers. In the long term, this perpetuates the cycle of poverty and HIV. The HIV AIDS epidemic has also contributed to increased rates of chronic non-communicable diseases worldwide. While antiretroviral medication has managed to significantly reduce the mortality rates of HIV, the use of this medication in the long term is associated with increased risk for diabetes, obesity, and other health conditions. Additionally, HIV infection itself is associated with several chronic non-communicable diseases, including hypertension and multiple types of cancer. The increased rates of these chronic diseases is a significant challenge to global health. The HIV AIDS epidemic is a significant driver for the TB epidemic. The HIV AIDS epidemic has led to a resurgence of TB, especially in Africa. HIV compromises an individual's immune system, increasing their risk for TB reactivation 
and therefore also increasing the incidence of TB cases in a population. Furthermore, HIV infection also increases an individual's susceptibility to TB, accelerates the progression of disease, and increases their chances of dying from TB. Therefore, the combination of both HIV and TB is a major threat to health worldwide. The HIV AIDS epidemic significantly impacts infant and child health worldwide. HIV can be transmitted from a mother to child during pregnancy, childbirth, or breastfeeding. Moreover, while antiretroviral medication has significantly lowered the chances of mother-to-child transmission, if a mother is unable to access the resources and medication needed to manage her infection, then the risks of transmitting HIV to her child still remains. Additionally, infants who are exposed to HIV from their mother but remain uninfected still have higher risks of mortality and morbidity. These children have increased likelihood of impaired immune systems, growth stunting, and are exposed to more opportunistic pathogens and psychosocial stressors. Therefore, managing the HIV AIDS epidemic is essential for protecting the health and well-being of children around the world. There exists the pronounced economic and demographic impact of HIV infection in third world countries due to the most economically able and productive age groups making up the predominant infected population. This greatly contributes to the occurrence of rising unemployment in vital industries such as agriculture and manufacturers, resulting in a reduction of national production and global export. This process negatively impacts the country's global trade and subsequent means to capital gain. Additionally, many third world countries utilize a large sum of their economic resources on treatment and care for HIV resulting in less resources available to contribute to the country's development. All these factors result in a vicious cycle of continued dependence of low-income countries on global health initiatives. Some of the challenges that women are facing include the lack of formal employment opportunities, and many women are forced to resort to commercial sex work, often for the survival of their own children. There is difficulty in forcing condom use, especially when women are financially dependent on their male partner. Furthermore, violence against women along with their low status in society are a contributing factor to the high prevalence of HIV among women. HIV is three times more prevalent in young women aged 15 to 24 in developing countries compared to men of the same age group. The stigma that women have around HIV also reduces the likelihood of them accessing preventative services. And, some cultures do not permit women from accessing care alone without a male partner. For example, in India, 80% of females require their male partner's permission to visit HIV clinics. In the developing world, 5 million people die each year from three main diseases, including tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV, which makes up 99% of all cases worldwide. Over the years, however, pharmaceutical companies have only developed about 21 new drugs for diseases common in developing countries, whereas approximately 1,500 drugs have been created for diseases common in the developed world. This phenomenon results from the poor profit potential in the developing world compared to the rich mine of America's chronic disease epidemic that guarantees people stay sick enough to continue paying for the next best drug. This highlights one of the many socioeconomic inequalities that determine health. Inequalities that have the capacity to increase a person's risk for diseases like HIV and their ability to receive treatment. Antiretroviral medication has been available since the 1990s, but it was initially deemed too costly for low-income countries. In 2006, the World Health Organization estimated that only around 28% of individuals that require antiretroviral treatment were receiving them worldwide. We can observe that new treatments for diseases do not necessarily lower the rate of illnesses, but rather it widens the gap between different socioeconomic classes and adds to the resulting in health inequities. Currently, more than 90% of HIV drugs that are now used in low-income and middle-class countries are generic brand. Governments are creating patent-holding firms to authorize generic production of HIV-related drugs for use in developing countries. Patent monopolies on prices and availability of drugs has made it difficult for countries to comply with their obligations to protect, respect, and fulfill the right to health for all their citizens. Well-designed laws can be effective tools to advance population health and equity. 
The following are global health policy recommendations that will begin to address the HIV epidemic and its health consequences. First recommendation we are making are for policies that address equitable access to antiretroviral therapy and concurrent care. Given the socioeconomic class of many HIV positive people, medication should be free. The HIV AIDS epidemic taints the discussion of funding healthcare, especially in low income countries. Second, the policy should include assessments of social situation, addressing if the patient has adequate nutrition, and if not, provide nutritional supplementation. Nutrition is crucial with antiretroviral therapy. Individuals who have HIV AIDS need to be included in policy creation to ensure new modes of treatment and prevention are applicable and continuously involve equitable access. This will involve a community assessment approach to developing care and treatment plans. And an example could include harm reduction centers that must be collaboratively open 24 seven. As one closes, the other center opens nearby. Lastly, physicians will be able to assess their patients for risk of diabetes and other non-communicable diseases and provide routine screening for all HIV patients. The second recommendation for a policy we have is to address gender inequalities and health disparities. Women bear a disproportionate burden of the world's poverty, experience more violence, and are systemically denied the same rights as men globally. Women in Sub-Saharan Africa are two times more likely to contract HIV than men. In Canada and Kenya, approximately half of all women have experienced physical or sexual violence in their teens. The policies we recommend include enhancing women's educational opportunities and promoting subsequent access to quality employment. Education should include combating the stigma of living with HIV. We want to mandate policy that promotes anti-violence against women. We also want to include workplace safety and compensation policies that are equal pay between men and women with living wages, protected work rights, the right to join a union, accessible work benefits, and mandatory safety and emergency training. Finally, we want to include anti-discrimination against women in workplaces where violations of this policy are punishable by fines or other work-related disciplinary action. And additionally, we want to provide resources for free legal services to enforce these policies. Next, we included a policy that addresses stigma and decriminalization of sex workers. Laws that criminalize buying, selling, and or procuring sex pose structural risk factors, exacerbate stigma and exclusion, abrogate access to essential health services, and increase risk of exploitation and violence. Criminalization also leads to more precarious working environments, risky sexual behavior, greater poverty, and overall increase in HIV risks. As previously mentioned, women in poverty resort to survival sex. Sexual decision making is largely in the male realm and women have little to no influence on condom usage. Even carrying condoms can provide police with evidence of prostitution resulting in routine police abuse. Studies confirm that countries that permit buying, selling, and procuring sex appear to have the lowest HIV prevalence among sex workers. Removing criminal laws allows sex workers to have increased access to condoms, reduce the risk of violence, and empowers women in condom negotiation. It creates a shift from discrimination and violence from law enforcement to receiving protection and support. It allows them to enter the formal economy and also to exit the sex industry more easily. Even in countries with unfair judiciary, criminalizing sex work will create safer work environments. The final recommendation is to create policies which influence equitable health research and clinical implementation. As investments in global health grows, there must be equal opportunity for countries to contribute to research as it drives subsequent policy implementation. Currently, there are imbalances in the issues that are being addressed through research. If economic and academic resources are difficult for African researchers to obtain, it is difficult to conduct appropriate researchers for those countries who have different clinical needs. This policy that we like to implement would have equitable, not equal partnership in sharing resources. This prevents African researchers from being invisible when their work. For example, having formal documentation of research goals and expectations. Also, we would like to have a policy that increases investment in African-based research by African investors. This will negate the dependency and equities in receiving funding from the rest and redirect focus on HIV AIDS issues that directly impact countries in Africa. An example is to have regional organizations provide incentive for African investors 
Additionally, more financial resources in African countries will decrease the brain drain to the West. High proportions of migrants living in high-income countries acquire HIV infection due to stigma and barriers that limit access to HIV prevention services. Due to stigma and financial constraints, many migrants are reluctant to use condoms or undergo HIV testing. Nurses can help reduce stigma by promoting HIV testing through social media. Additionally, public health nurses can provide free home HIV testing kits, which will help engage individuals that are not reached by other testing programs. Nurses can help advocate for HIV programs to be integrated into other services for migrants. For example, HIV testing can be bundled with diabetes and hypertension screening, which has been shown to have significantly higher uptake. These interventions help to normalize testing and can reduce stigma surrounding HIV prevention. Antiretroviral therapy has helped to transform HIV from a terminal illness to a chronic disease. However, good clinical outcomes depends on access and adherence to treatment. Barriers preventing successful treatment in low-income countries include lack of awareness of HIV status, poor healthcare infrastructure, and resources. To increase HIV testing and diagnosis, nurses can advocate for community testing. For example, implementing mobile voluntary counseling and testing services in community centers and public places. Additionally, nurses can lobby governments to implement a policy for routine opt-out testing of HIV. Nurses can also provide counseling to increase adherence to antiretroviral therapy. As a result, this can improve individual health and lower HIV infectivity on a public health level. Individual nurses and the nursing profession have the professional responsibility to respond to inequities in the healthcare system and advocate for change. The lived experience of every individual with illness and disease is dependent on their access to health services and supports and basic necessities of daily living. Nurses must work to promote and overcome barriers to equalities in healthcare. Equitable access and empowerment for women must be advocated at all levels. Addressing larger environmental and social factors can help reduce the risk of exposure to and improve a person's capacity to seek appropriate treatment for HIV AIDS. Public education and awareness on the social determinants of health and its implication to the health of others is needed to increase social participation in combating health disparities. This in turn would not only improve the health and well-being of vulnerable groups, but would help reduce the stigmatization against HIV AIDS.